OK, despite the really prosaic title, what is MPT? I'm not going to tell you. We're going to learn about it together, because the only way to engage with this is to do it. Have any of you read any of the papers tied to this? Because lots of people say it's written in quite an obscure way. Well, yes and no. It's only, I mean, the key to doing this kind of work is to think with it and to do it, and to think with examples. If you think in abstract, it doesn't make any sense. Or well, it does make sense, but actually thinking with an example really, really helps. So the task we're going to be involved in today, and we're going to do two different ones at different time points, is doing it in action. That's when you're going to start to make sense of it. Um, it might be annoying, but hopefully it will be fun. We'll see what happens. And the other thing is that <coughs> MPT is not some holy grail. It's not something that you can't muck around with. It's up to you to use it in ways that are useful for you. So when we go to the toolkit, you'll see some of the questions. Some of the questions might be really relevant to the project you're working on. Others won't be. It doesn't matter. We don't care. Yeah? It's not a prescriptive thing. And that's what you get with a lot of theory work, which is actually you need to do it this way unless you haven't done it properly. Actually, it's a toolkit to engage with whatever's useful. And if nothing's useful, Maybe you want to come and talk to us at the end of the day, and maybe I can find something that's useful. But bits of it might be. I mean, one of the things we did is we, quite a few years ago, actually, we did a website for people like you, basically for people that weren't academics interested in academic discussion around this kind of stuff. It was meant to be as, and as engaging as we could do at the time while being vaguely kind of serious. Um, so this is normalizationprocess.org. Um, it kind of works. Lots of people over the world visit it, including some of the major institutions around the world. It does lots of technical stuff. So it's got about, um, it un unpacks the theory itself, um, including examples of what the heck lots of these technical terms mean. Some of these are better than others, and we need to update this. Some of these, we realize over time, are slightly obscure. Um, the other thing is it gives you an introduction, which Tracy will talk about later on, about what kind of data you might need to use to think about MPT. So there's a whole range of things you can use, be it hard or soft data, to try and inform your work around this kind of stuff. But the key thing, and this is the thing we're going to work on today, is the toolkit, um, which is an interactive thing. And we've got a paper copy in your um, pack as well. Um, and that's what we're going to work with. It's just 16 questions. It's a very simple thing to do. Now, the questions, ideally, will take a long time to answer, because the job of this is not to go yes or no. The job of this toolkit is to engage you in discussion to think about things. Yeah? So this toolkit is best done, and actually MPT work in itself, I'd say, is always best done in collaboration with others. Because the key to this is not where this bar moves to. It's the discussion you have that raises loads of issues that might be really important. Yeah? That is the absolute key. It's a tool to enable that dialogue and that engagement. So I'll give you an example, because we're about to do it again um, collectively in a bit. This was uh, a major HGA-funded thing, a couple of million pounds. As with many things, many randomized controlled trials, it failed to show any effect. And actually, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things. But there's something really interesting. If you, do, if you think about this, um, using some of the questions in MPT, it, you can make good practical sense about why it didn't work, and actually why it should have been changed at various points. So on these 16 questions, they ask you to think through various things. So the first question is, participants distinguish the intervention from current ways of working. And then we've got another way of describing it, whether the intervention is easy to describe to participants and whether they can appreciate how it differs or is clearly distinct from current ways of working. One of the reasons we have two things is because we could never quite agree what phrasing was better. But hey, it's whatever works for you. So the key question here is, and you've always got to think about it, who are the participants? Because it's never just one participant. There's loads of actors involved in every, all of this kind of stuff. So in this one, and this is just a small section of the participants we could have worked around. Trial team, general, general practitioners, practice managers, practice nurses, and patients. When you're doing the tool, it's really best the first time you go through it to choose one group and think about their position. Yeah? And that's what we're going to do in this round. Choose one group and think about their position. In the next task, we're actually going to do multiple groups at the same time. 
Um, and hopefully there will be no violence, blood or anything else but that. But actually to get a sense about how people have radically different perspectives on the same thing. So I'm just going to think about practice nurses. And I'm going to ask the question, did, the, did practice nurses distinguish the intervention from current ways of working? Not at all. Okay? Now that's a bad thing when you're implementing something. We're going to, going to come along, we're going to bring in this radical change, and as far as they're concerned, it's no different from what we're already doing. Why are you putting all this effort and energy involved in it? So that's a really bad thing. And I'm just going to briefly go through probably six or seven of these to describe how practice nurses were in quite an odd position, and it makes sense about why it wasn't implemented from their point of view, why it doesn't make sense for them. So did they collectively agree about the purpose of the intervention? No, they had a kind of whole range of understandings about what it could be. There was no clear message about why it was going down. You're asking us to do something we already do, but in a slightly different way. To what end? They were kind of a bit lost. Did they individually understand what their intervention requires of them? Well, yes, they were given a very specific, discrete set of tasks. I mean, to a certain degree. Um, did they see any potential value for them in their work? Absolutely not, with a few exceptions. And the only practice nurses that saw value were those that were really interested in research and wanted to get engaged in research. The rest of them, actually, no value whatsoever. Next set of questions. Were key individuals driving the intervention forward? Well, yes, it was the research nurses um, that were interested. The nurse, practice nurses that were into research were doing it. The rest of them were just kind of uh, following it around. Did they think it should be a part of their work? Well, no. As far as they were concerned, the right people to be engaged in discussions about diet and lifestyle advice to this group of patients were community nurses. And the great irony is, in the early stages of the trial, they said, actually, community nurses might be quite good. But they're really, we don't want to work with them because they're really hard to do a randomised controlled trial on. So there's a kind of level of, that, that's not good reason for not engaging with that group. Um, so did the participants buy into the intervention? The nurses didn't, um, in general terms. Did they continue to support the intervention? Well, not really. One of the issues about buy-in um, is the fact that they weren't the ones that said, yes, we want to take part. It was practice managers and GP, uh, GP leads that said, yes, you can come into our practice and do this. And of course we do it, and then we'll give it to the practice nurses. So there's a kind of level you get, I don't need to go through the rest of the stories. There's a kind of level, you, if you went through asking these questions about this, clearly you need some relevant knowledge to answer this, but actually you get a sense that this thing is not going to work. I mean, oh yeah, I don't need the rest of them, but there's, there's 16 questions. But the point is, it's engaging in that dialogue, asking these questions and having that out loud discussion, ideally with a group of people that are involved in the problem. It's never just the managers, because you're never going to get a good answer. It's never just the practice nurses. It's all the people that are relevant to that, to have that dialogue, to engage with them. Yeah? Now, that's as simple as MPT gets. I think it's phenomenally doable. Yeah? And it's your job to come with the right knowledge and to gain the right knowledge to answer these questions. And actually, one of the things you can learn again and again is we don't have the right knowledge. So therefore, we need to go and discover about those kind of issues. So, oh yeah, and, and actually, it does some science as well. If you like diagrams, and basically that says, I mean, it basically says that there's not much that's going to work there. If it's out here, um, I mean, people like diagrams. It doesn't matter. Um, so those kind of things. Uh, and, and equally, we do put a health warning on. It's not a scientific instrument. People phone us up and say, why aren't there numbers on the bar? Yeah, or actually email us. What can we do with the numbers or the bar when it comes out? That's not the point. It's a discussion and dialogue tool. We are building a questionnaire, a, a survey device at the moment. That's what we're doing. And that's what was tested on you lot at the moment. That's very much in progress. Hence, rather than having a couple of questions about specific things, you might have read three or four or five about the same things. So I'm sorry you had to experience that, but say la vie. So, so what we're going to do, first group, we've got three groups. So frail elderly is nice and close. Um, COPD is going to have to stumble over to there, and end of life it is near the door. So there's some, some kind of symbolic work that's gone around this. So what I want you to do is um, read the scenarios. You've all got them in the pack. Um, and then you're going to be split into tables. So just, just try and maybe not sit with your friends. Maybe sit with some other people. I know it can be daunting. And then have a quick five-minute discussion, just in any terms you want. Um, 
about the, about the intervention, about what the problems could be. But the key thing in this round is we want you to think about one group of participants, not talk about loads of different ones, yeah? And the lead will tell you which group you will talk about, sorry. We have to do it that way. I mean, normally we do this based on what people's idea, what interventions they're working with themselves. But it, with this kind of group, there's too many different people, we'll, we'll stick with this, yeah? And then for the rest of the 15 minutes, go through the questions one by one, having a discussion. I think the key is, there's no way you're gonna get through the 16 questions. I'd be stunned. Um, there will be no prizes, because actually it's the discussion that's key. Does that make sense? Yep, okay, all right, thank you very much. So, as, as I said, to make sense of this, you need to do it, and you've just done part of it. And I realise these are examples that you're unfamiliar with, and I realise in my group it was a piece of research, implementing a research study, rather than uh, in, 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 implementing something that was already evidence-based, but some of the other groups are doing that. We just chose examples that we know we've got lots of MPT stuff on it already, rather than specifically <coughs> that. And it doesn't matter what stage of the intervention is at, whether it's a piece of research, whether nice guidelines you're in, implementing those, whatever it is, it's exactly the same process you'd go through. Yeah? yeah. So, um, any initial impressions that anyone wants to raise? Or any complaints? Or joy? Or happiness? Hi, thank you. I'm Lynn Hanrashi from Estella's Farmer. Um, I think in my group it created an awful lot of discussion, um, so much so we actually only managed to answer the first question, so I think Fine. it would take quite some time yeah. to get through the 16, but it was uh, very thought-provoking and, and generated um, a lot of conversation. Uh, and, and do you think it was a good discussion? Yes. Yeah. Was it, I mean, was it useful? Yes. Because there's a thing about you might want to think about recording these discussions, either minuting them or audio recording this kind of stuff, rather than just having it. Because a lot of the time, we have these wonderful discussions and then someone forgets about it whatsoever. And someone just takes out of it what they think is the right thing, rather than learning from that kind of collective. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, any other comments or questions? I, I thought it was quite interesting in terms of it then begs another set of questions, doesn't it? So it was a little bit, you know, false in the sense that we didn't know which this group of people were. And yeah. it, so it was, you're trying to think about what might they think. But I think that goes back to your original issue, which was it's useful as a planning tool. Yeah. And I think that's really helpful because then you can start to say, actually, it could be this or it could be that. Therefore, if we want to implement this thing, we need to be thinking about these these other issues. So it gives you another sort of set of questions or another set of actions yeah. about what you might do. So uh, I thought uh, that uh, was already yeah. coming out even after looking at one or two questions that, that started uh, and equally, to Another group yeah. of people to have around the table um, yeah. or people that knowledge about yeah. that specific thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other comments, questions? That was easy. Hi, for our group, we managed to get question four. Not that it's competition, <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> but I think for us it brought out about how it helps you drill down into different perspectives, uh -huh. even within um, probably the same uh, group of uh, team. Um, so we had healthcare assistants. We talked about healthcare assistants. So I think it did help bring and challenge some of um, your assumptions about change or um, assumptions about how things might or might not work, and bring out and explore different um, people's perspectives. That would help negate some of the problems later down the line if yeah. you did this at the start. Yeah, yeah. and th there's another group I was talking to where they were aware that in one location the nurses would be thinking X because of their past experience. In another location, they'd be thinking Y, and making sense that it, they're never just a group of nurses. There's always situational things that are going on around that. And you might want to not only do it, which adds to the labour, just think about nurses per se, for example, it might be actually at this location versus this location, and, and those kind of things. Okay, anything else? No. Okay. You sure? Anyone find it really problematic, hated it? Yeah. I don't mean it in a really bad way, but actually things... The language, was that a problem? Making sense of the questions? And, and OK, how many of you disagreed about where to put the mark? Thanks. I wouldn't say that we necessarily disagreed, but I think we probably 
all could agree that people in in real life who <laughs> were fic fictionally representing were likely to disagree and that yeah. there was likely to be a huge range yeah. of different opinions yeah. and values. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and, and that's an issue. And, and that's why I don't care where the bar is. It's recognising that the, for the fact that there is a range that's really key rather than just lumping them as a group. Of course they're going to do it because they're X. Yeah. Can I ask a question about that? Though? No. <laughs> does, does that not then mean that the tendency, if you're sitting together to do that and you accept that there's sort of a range, that you end up putting the thing in the middle? Yeah, but, so everything ends up right down the middle? Yeah, but, but as I said, I don't care where it is on the bar. It's the discussion. If you're saying there's variability, so the next question is, OK, how can we transform that variability and get collective agreement about that? Is that one of our targets? What do we need to do? Or what group can learn from another group that they might be more, more happy with it or not? We found, that, we found that not only was there a range, but also um, there was the potential for that position to move over time, yep. depending on training, the, the environment, the experience of using whatever. So we thought it was quite a sort of fluid thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and exactly that would be one of the issues that actually you might want to think about this at time point one and time point two and note that actually that change can happen and actually to see whether or not your intervention, whatever that is, made a difference to, to get a sense of that kind of thing. But yeah. Yeah, this, yeah. yeah. We did this COPD one, and it was very clear that none of us on the table were a nurse. And we were looking at what the nurses, uh, whether the impact on the nurse is working. So it was very clear you need the right people in the group yeah. before you start and look at the intervention. Uh, but also, it generated discussion about actually what is their current ways of working at the moment yeah. and really do we fully understand it and have we explored it enough to know whether this intervention is something different or not yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and i think that's true most lots of implementation to speak grossly is the fact that people don't map the territory they expect they think they already know and they go in and go it's only going to be a slight change and actually yeah it, it's a being aware of what's already going on now um we've only got a couple of minutes for this any other questions? Uh, can I just ask a question? So, uh, no. as I understand it, um, once you like thought through all these different questions, you would then want to go ahead and like design some sort of intervention to make sure that, um, well, or like an implementation intervention that these this intervention works out for these, this group of people, yeah. right? So like once, once the intervention is in place and you know, nurses are being trained and they get like demonstrations, like ideally would you want them to answer all these questions like quite highly? Um, <laughs> it, 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 it depends. I mean, I think, yeah, sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it, it depends. It's not always that have to be high that is a good thing. And I'm trying to think of an example where, where, where um, I don't mind if they don't collectively agree, as long as it's... I mean, one of the key questions there is often, is it workable? And the key thing is, can people, as part of their everyday work, fit it into their work? Or does it radically breach what they do? And we see that again and again. We bring in interventions that completely destroy what they normally do. And that, that's often a really key one out of anything. If, if this thing can nicely fit in to, to what you already do and doesn't massively disrupt your relationships with others, specifically your relationship with patients or, or, or others, then actually it's a goer. So there are some key ones. Um. Uh, so uh, would you then, like beforehand, before making an implementation intervention, sort of um, agree on a couple of questions that you would put a lot of emphasis on, that you want to like boost this? Yeah, yeah. potentially, yeah. yeah. It, it like making be... it more... Yeah. yeah. Um, can I just add, in the last workshop, we'll be talking more about how you might use it in different, for, for different things like planning or implementing or evaluating. So we'll move towards that at the end of the day. So, yeah. There, there was one more question. Caroline Wills from um, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir NHS Trust. It was just a comment, just the overlap and the similarities with sort of just organisational change theory, yeah. which I think will come through the day. But obviously, I mean, that bit to me was just like your stakeholder analysis yeah. and just starting to think about that. So mm -hmm. I think it's just, it would be interesting to see how it moves on through the day for me. Yeah. So, okay. so that was just a comment. Yeah. Yeah.
so in this second part, what we wanted to do was just to kind of explore this idea around different perspectives and how to take into account different perspectives when you're thinking through an implementation problem. It's clear already from the first workshop um, and also from Carl's presentation um, that we really do need to think about the different stakeholders involved here um, and try to capture the, the most relevant perspectives in thinking through the problems. Um, so we often pose the question when we're doing work with MPT of normalization for who? So um, who are we interested in? Who does it have to become normal for? Uh, and how can we understand their perspective? So again, we're back to, to this idea of complexity. We've got different roles. We've got different perspectives. We've got the front-end clinical staff who um, are often the point of, of contact with the patient, um, and they're, they're doing something new when they're, um, when they're in their professional practice. Um, but we also have, you know, they're generally part of teams. Um, and so those teams involve other people. Some of those people, they're delivering the interventions as well themselves, but they're also managing others um, in, in delivering this new intervention. Okay, so they sometimes have different hats, you know, and if you're thinking about the toolkit, they might be, have to think about it first as a person who's actually doing the stuff, um, and they might have to think about it as somebody who watches and oversees what other people are doing, and they're quite different perspectives, so you can already imagine there, you might have some difference in how, how you would think about the questions in the toolkit. Okay, you also have others in the referral process. So um, a lot of these interventions, they, they cut across boundaries. They involve referrals from different services within an organization and across different organizations. And it depends on the, the scale of, of change that you're thinking about in any particular problem. Um, another set of key actors um, that we often don't really think very much about, but what we've found in the work that we've done, who are often really, really important, are the, the administrators, the technical people, the support staff. Um, if we're d putting in a new intervention around clinical practice, you might think it's really the, the clinical staff that this intervention is mostly about, but that can't happen with all of the other things that go on. And um, for example, uh, we're, we're starting to look at some work involved where it involves administrators calling patients up to prime them about things like smoking cessation and other things like that. And that's very key to, to the intervention um, that they're trying to put in place. Um, so those people then take on quite new and different roles that are actually really important because they're a step in the engagement process. So important to think about those people as well. Um, also, layered on top of all of this, we have researchers and we have evaluators and we've already, there have been a couple of mentions about, you know, what is it we're implementing here? There's the clinical service, but often there's an evaluation which may be formal, it might be a randomised controlled trial, or it might be just your own more pragmatic um, evaluation in terms of appraising what's going on. And sometimes those things can get in the way. Um, but evaluators are often involved as well and they have their own perspective too that you might want to think about. And of course, more senior people um, who are managing these interventions and planning them, um, thinking about the implementation of them. And sometimes they're quite far removed from what is actually happening on the ground and what the issues are when you're actually engaging with patients. Um, so. I think, but I think already kind of we're getting a good feel for why different perspectives are important. To help that along, I wanted to talk through an example, but I'll perhaps be a bit quicker than I might have been, um, given we're running a little behind. But um, we did a lot of work around teledermatology sort of in the early 2000s, 1999, 2000. It, it was a really popular idea because, in theory, taking some, um, le some photographs of skin problems, filling in some information on a computer because it's such a visual um, problem, the idea was that, okay, well, we can do that and we can send it to the consultant. The nurse can go out and do that, send it to the consultant, get a diagnosis. We can save people having to come to the hospital. Um, so that was the idea around that. Um, but, of course, these things are never as simple as you might think. So 
um, I flagged up three key groups here that we were looking at, and I've used the MPT constructs to kind of frame this sort of analysis. The key people in this intervention were specialist dermatology nurses, so they had already quite a lot of expertise around dermatological problems. Um, so did it make sense to them? Well, in, in a sense, it was skill development. It was something new. Um, they saw it as developing new skills, working out in primary care independently, running their clinics, seeing patients. Um, so that appealed. But in another way, it didn't make sense because although they could do that, they still had a lot of limits on what they could do and how they could practice autonomously autonomously, they could, un they could see what the problem was, perhaps, but they couldn't give any diagnosis. Um, so, and they didn't see it saving patients that much time traveling. Now, this was being done in, in Manchester, so it was an urban area. There wasn't a lot to be gained. Okay, so, um, so for the consultants, though, it was, it was a... Um, they could see it as potentially reducing waiting time, but it turned out that it didn't. Um, they saw it as, as, as development for their profession, as to be seen as trying this out, testing it, evaluating it, building on knowledge. Um, and so they, they could see some sense in it. But what happened was, and, and people were engaged, the different groups, they were engaged there, but... Um, but actually, when it came to delivering it, it was quite difficult. The nurses had to go out into primary care. Um, they found it very constraining because they had a, co a computer screen that they had to fill in very fixed questions. They couldn't really exercise their own judgment as much as they would have liked to. Um, in terms of monitoring and appraisal, they didn't really end up getting access to any data about whether it worked or not. Um, they couldn't really say. They had a sense that there were limitations and patients were still going back to their consultant for a face-to-face -face meeting anyway. Um, so, but they didn't have access to any data. The consultants, on the other hand, they did find it really difficult. They realised how much of their practice relied on actually talk, seeing the patient, feeling the problems, talking about it with them, and they ended up just calling in lots of patients for face-to-face -face meetings. So the benefits weren't really realised. They had that data, but they never did anything with it. Um, so we also did look at patient advocates, um, and they had a real sense that this was not really going to meet the needs of, of the patients. Okay, but they were not very involved in it. Um, so what we'd like to do with the, the group work is to go back to your case study groups, um, and we're going to do a little bit more work with the tool. Um, but we'd like you, within your small groups, to agree at least two different roles, but maybe three, based on your case study, um, and work through some of the questions, making sure that you, you kind of take each, each of those role perspectives into account while you're answering the questions on the tool. OK. Um, yes? getting to that point, because you've already started with the tool and you've answered the first set of questions. Um, we thought if you start with question nine for this one, so that will kind of skip you a bit further through the, the 16 items, um, and that would, be, uh, that would be the best way to do it, we think. Yeah, and we've, we've done question nine, because it's all about what is the work, what do people practically have to do when they're faced with it, which is kind of the core. Of, of this approach, looking at people, what a practice people have to do on the ground. Yes. Okay, so it's time to go back to the groups. Thank you. What we were trying to do in that workshop was obviously structure a discussion more focused around trying to understand the different perspectives and how you might incorporate those in working through, through the tool. So um, just, just a few kind of questions just to guide this uh, discussion here. But we, the first one we want to ask was, what, what did you find challenging um, about that? Does anyone want to offer up any thoughts about the challenges of, of trying to do this? Yeah. Uh, Catherine? Oh. Thanks. Um, I guess even when we were taking a different perspective, we realised that there was massive variation within that role. So, for instance, for a patient, we were doing the COPD one about whether they had the skills to adopt yeah. the intervention and said, well, 
for some of them who have the, the capability to do it, it would be fine, but for mm. others where they maybe have other comorbidity or they're a little demented or blind or deaf, etc., mm. it would be very difficult. So it is quite hard, even if you're looking at different perspectives, to come to agreements because there's so much variation within each of those perspectives. Yeah. Okay. That that's a really good point. Uh, hang on. First, before, I'm just going to ask a question back, if that's okay. Um, do, did you have any discussion in your group then about how you might get around that or how you might deal with that if you were using the tool? I think we were thinking that we'd have to have some clearly defined criteria for who it would be appropriate for, so we'd take away a bit of that variation uh -huh. at the outset. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else have have an experience they want to share from? from that. Everyone's being quiet. No? Does everyone want lunch? <laughs> oh, we've got one, Catherine, just here. Hello. Um, so I was just wondering, because I was taking a look at this. All right. And um, I think Tim was talking about uh, earlier that uh, some of the questions, they like there's always a set of questions that relate to one of those um, four ca categories, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly. Yeah. So I was just wondering how you came up with those categories and how did you make sure that that's comprehensive? Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a longer story than that. So. That's a really big question. <laughs> we, we, we've written about it in about five or six open access papers. So I'll give you the papers. Ah, papers, yeah. okay. No, does it, can uh, I just say something about this? I, I don't have a microphone, but okay. I can stand Stop. here. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, we derived these categories from uh, initially from uh, reanalysis of qualitative data from 23 separate studies and that was the first set of categories and then Tracy and I um, recognized that there were some areas that we hadn't covered and that there were not inadequate coverage but inadequate explanation and then from a series of further studies we derived more uh, constructs as it were and we then road tested those constructs in a set of other studies, uh, probably about 10 million pounds worth of work, actually. Probably about 40 studies worth about 10 million pounds. So um, uh, uh, all, of these, all of these constructs are absolutely rooted in real experience in either the UK or the United States or Australian settings. So the constructs that um, appear in the 2009 paper that Tracy and I wrote have all been road tested um, in processes in um, Melbourne, Australia, or the US, or Canada, or uh, the UK and Europe. And um, subsequently, other research has kind of verified that they're not fantasies, as it were, that they are actually real. Um, so these are things that have been empirically demonstrated to matter. I think it's just worth reiterating that we're, we're not in the business of philosophical speculation, even though I am interested in inventions <laughs> and phenomenology and the joy of um, social systems research. Yeah, and can I just say too that we intentionally directed you in that workshop to look at the questions beginning from uh, question nine. Now, in terms of the four constructs, when we, the, the work that we started with in developing MPT was, uh, and if you're looking at the papers, the published papers, you'll come across NPM, Normalization Process Model. And we tried to avoid saying too much about the development of the theory because it adds another layer of probably confusion and despair to try to do that. But we did start with a model. And now the model um, actually began with that, that, that section, that page that you started on then, which was the questions from 9 to, to 13. Uh, 9 to 12, sorry. So uh, yes, so um, that, that grew out of the work where we were really observing what people were actually doing with, um, around things like telecare and e-health. Uh, so, and from there, we broadened out our perspective, and that's how the, the other three concepts 
constructs uh, came into the model. So we started with the observation of what actually people do and moved that out to, just to further around the whole process because, of course, we realised there were things happening before, there were things happening after, and that they were all really important. But if anybody really wants to get to grips with that, do just ask us. We'll, we'll be happy to explain. OK. We may, we may be walk, um, going soon to this afternoon's thinking, but um, just to raise a couple of points from, from this session. I, I think maybe we're just a very good table, but we found it quite easy, I think, to take on the challenges of looking at multiple perspectives. People are fairly used to that, and actually just acknowledging that there really are um, sometimes quite different perspectives and, and outcomes and things. Um, but do, how to address that? This afternoon, I hope. Yeah. Um, and then, but there were a couple of things to speak out. One was the, the the trust word was a really big word that came out. You know, about again how different disciplines and different organisations trust each other, mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily something we 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 are particularly good at. And this idea of there being a host organisation mm. is just bonkers. And yeah. and, and uh, you know maybe relevant, Carl, to what you're talking about. But you know when we think about the big examples internationally of, of things that have really been done, they're very often within a single organisation, a single leader saying, no guys, you're just going to do it this way. We're back to Royal Navy thinking, rather than this complex, bizarre NHS, uh, multiple organisations, different incentives, different disincentives, different values, uh, and we kind of sometimes, you know, don't kind of acknowledge that enough, and whether we can do anything yeah. in this bizarre set of, you know, various organisations. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking at Carl saying, don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, I was talking the other day to Richard Granger, who's the guy who um, ran the national program for IT in the NHS for about 10 years. Um, uh, and uh, for various reasons, he's quite dissatisfied with the progress of, of that. <laughs> um, uh, but he, he introduced quite an interesting phrase to, to my thinking, which is toxic heterogeneity. <coughs> he said that, that having so many different groups left, um, uh, created an almost toxic environment of competition between them or disagreement between them, in which it was very difficult to achieve anything. I, I don't hold with that view, actually. I think that one of the reasons that NPFIT failed was because it, the people who were designing systems paid almost no attention to what clinicians actually do in practice and refused to have anything to do with them until the system was designed. So there's a disagreement there about how to interpret events. But the, there's a... The, the, the problem is, of course, that... If you're going to introduce something that is complex and difficult, it, it requires, um, at some level, acknowledgement of the fact that relationships between different groups are part of that complexity. But I'm absolutely with Simon here about um, the, the almost Byzantine nature of um, that in the NHS. But what I would say is, um, uh, this is a problem in all yep. very large organisations. And if we were looking at the Veterans Administration in the US, which provides, which is an almost equivalent organisation to the NHS, but which serves the families and, uh, of serving and former servicemen, in the, uh, service persons, sorry, in the United States. If we looked at how that functions, I think we would see very similar problems. We might see them dressed up in, in a different kind of vocabulary, yeah. uh, but something very similar goes on there. And it certainly goes on in the French healthcare system, which is another national healthcare system. So there are, there are problems that belong to large organisations, especially large organisations that are broken up into multiple parts, um, and where those multiple parts have... Uh, um, not very much freedom of action, but total responsibility. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, or total accountability for the things that they can't control. I think there are lots of, there are lots of big institutional kind of problems there that are beyond the scope of an enterprise like this. Um, uh, because 
thinking about yeah. implementing specific systems in a complex environment, we, we have to account and acknowledge the complexity of the environment. But uh, 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 actually, the business of changing that environment is the business of politics. Um, uh, and um, uh, there, are, there are political ideas with both a small and a large P about how to, to make that happen that are beyond the scope of normalization process theory. So um, we're on to the last workshop session. Um, so I'm just going to remind myself of what we're doing. We're staying in our case study groups for this, but we're no longer talking about the case study. Um, this session is to have a more general discussion within those small groups um, about how you yourselves might use MPT, uh, what you might use it for, uh, and to think about these questions that we've put on the slide here. So, I mean, would you use it after today? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm sure you'll at least have some thoughts on that question. Um, but if you do want to use it, when might you use it? Can you think of examples from your own work and your own experience where it might be useful? Uh, how, how would you use it? Would you, would you want to work through the toolkit that you've had a go at this morning? Would you use it to write some more general open-ended questions? Uh, would you use it to have discussions with people and so forth? Um, and if you are going to use it, what data would you collect? What information might you collect with it? What would you want to find out? Okay, so, do, yeah. do you need to add anything, Tim? No, I think it's about, as we said at the start, it's about how do you make it at home? So what, if, if there's a bit of it that works for you, we want to understand that. Or if none of it does, we'd like to understand that. But, I mean, how would you make it at home and use it? And we have got 20 minutes because we, we can be on time. Oh, wow. well, wow. okay, so um, we'll move back now to, to the three uh, breakout areas um, and allow you to have those discussions in your groups. Okay, so one of the things I asked the tables I was involved in and some of the tracing was, Tracy was, Tracy was involved mm. in, to feed back a couple of key points per table. So does any table want to say something? to share their experience? I think there was general consensus around our table that we'd be very happy to use the uh, NPT, that it might need some adaptation for particular requirements. We also had quite a lot of discussion about the language, and I think we would like it in plain language or plainer language. We had just some discussion about the uh, the use of definitions. Mm. Obviously, definitions can clarify the meaning, but yeah. if you have to define something, it's not plain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I think to feedback on that, and, and I was involved in part of that discussion, the <laughs> language has always been the issue. And th there is a kind of level of um, the tool questions we've got there were one generation of making it more accessible. And you compare that to different generations of the academic papers. And the questionnaire that we sent out that anyone was involved in is another generation of making it simple. And we're trying to make it simpler and simpler and simpler over the time. But there will come a point when it, it, needs to re it loses any of its theoreticalness and becomes too everyday. But I think we're getting closer and closer. But, and equally as the discussion was on the table, that, that part of the job of doing this, this is thinking about putting it in your own terms always using some of these language, not asking the questions in that way, but if you put it in your own terms and it makes sense to you, that's fantastic. So we all have to do a bit of translation mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we will be changing the questions to make them more accessible, but to fit different contexts and to fit different users. So as the discussion was going on, how you engage with patients might be radically different from managers, might be radically different from um, a, a, a staff nurse. And you'd have to, it has to be that flexible and adaptable. So yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll feed back for our table. We were sitting in the corner here. Um, we, we had a sort of fairly mixed view, I think. 
So if you want two things, I'll come up with a positive and a, a negative. I think from the positive point of view, we were um, there were a few of us who thought we may use NPT in the future. And one of its advantages was that um, you could use it however you wanted, really. You could sort of used to generate questions. You could use it as a, um, a, a tool for, for reviewing things. Um, and, and actually, the, the, that it had quite a lot of flexibility in it. Um, from a more negative point of view, I think um, maybe one or two of us wondered, well, what, what is its unique selling point over and above other um, implementation theories, strategies, techniques, etc.? And why, why, why is, what, what is it that adds the value for, for this particular uh, tool. I, by the way, I, I did um, declare my de uh, declaration of interest on the table that Tracy's co-supervising my PhD, so... Uh. <laughs> Watch what you say. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, did anybody at any other tables have that point uh, before we move on? Well, I was... Sorry. Um, I was thinking, um, how is that different to any other frameworks? To, for developing complex interventions, such as the um, um, intervention mapping approach, for example, because that one is very complex. And I Which thought one? intervention mapping approach, okay. um, because it made me think about the same things in different ways. So I, I was just going to ask you how different or similar they are and what, what advantage would be, or would we have in using this one over another one, for example? I'm, I'm not familiar enough with, with that particular approach to answer. I, I think um, what we're aiming for is a balance between you know, enough structure and guidance, but also keeping in some of that flexibility. So I think Ian summed that up quite well, actually. Sometimes you want an approach to be, to be flexible um, so that you can use it in the way that you want to use it. So I can't, I can't entirely um, answer that. but. Maybe we can come back to that. Hi, Anne Greenlee from North England Commissioning Support. I think my point, it was raised and alluded to earlier on as well, and, and it does link to that, is yeah. in terms of change management and project management and the Cotter's model for change management and all of those theories. But actually, I think this helped me because I think with most project management, it's identifying key stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think a lot of projects fail at that step. Okay. And I think this actually helps you identify what a stakeholder is. Right. And I think particularly it was one of the um, it was the decision support tool that was referenced yeah. earlier with the MIs. Uh -huh. Actually uh -huh. understanding that nurses aren't, a, so they're kind of subset and the subset and really thinking of the differences. So for me, it kind of helped me frame that and really understand that a little bit more as well. So I think they're complementary. Okay. Yeah, Great. I think coming back to answer all of those questions together, what's the USP? Well, I think the, the central thing is this has always been based on what people are practically doing on the ground. That's what we're really interested in. Uh, and I think that is, it, it's a variation on the theme and it takes it very, very seriously. And not all of the others do. A lot of them are in, uh, and equally it's about how people come together and do that work. Now, whichever one you choose is fine, but it's choosing the best bits of all of them is probably a better way around. Rather than, because all of these tools for want of a better word, configure the user. They tell you how to act and how to think. And actually, you should be using them in your own way to adapt to, to situations. Because I think lots of them, they turn around and say, they are the theory of everything. If you follow these paths, you will have wisdom and change practice. And it's nonsense. It's just using the bit, different bits as you go along <laughs> that make sense given that project and given that situation you're involved in. And that's why we'd, we always say, just use the bits that are useful. If, not, if none of it's useful, that's fine. Or if one question's useful, that's fine. Or if one issue, it might be how people make sense of it is useful, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Whatever makes sense. So, yeah, that would be my response. Um, useful is that I'm actually trying to develop and set up a new service. Um, and I'm about a year or something down the line. And... I've actually done a lot of this without mm. knowing about it. I've found yeah. it out as I've gone along. Whereas I think it would probably have been a lot easier and quicker to think about this at the start mm. and kind of identify challenges and yeah. barriers that are there that you don't actually think about. You see it yeah. from your perspective and you don't think about other people necessarily and how it might impact on them. And this would have really helped me to mm. focus more on that and taking an earlier approach to overcoming the challenges. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I think that's how, certainly how this tool that we've worked with today was intended, really, <coughs> as, as a planning type tool, as a way to think through the problem at an early stage. That's kind of what we intended um, for that. But um, as you would appreciate, it, if, if you were to want to use that to maybe assess how things are going on at a later stage, it's not not so useful, perhaps, um, which is why we're developing other things like, like the more detailed questions. Just to say a little bit about the survey that had lots of questions in as opposed to the 16 items we've been working with, um, how we've approached that is, is to kind of unpack the constructs quite a bit within our research team, our wider research team, uh, to understand what the different components are, break them all down, put them into separate questions, test them by um, getting people to use think aloud techniques. So we worked through the questions, which flagged up all sorts of issues around the words that we use, and you know, really trying to make it a much those questions much more plain language. So we would hope that. In the end, um, we're kind of try we're doing more work around what, what we've used today. It was e a bit easier to manage uh, in a workshop situation, but we are working on more simple ways of conveying the theory. And you, we could, you could argue, actually, we could argue that you don't need to worry too much about the definitions and the construct definitions and the very complicated presentations that, um, of the theory that it. Um, that, if you uh, don't want to. If you don't want to in some of the papers. Or if you can't sleep at night, maybe you do. So that's not so, not so important. What is important, we think, is being, being able to address the key issues. Hi, yeah, I was just going to say, we, um, I don't think our group ever got past about question one on each section. Mm. And you said earlier on about recording the conversation. Yeah. Because one of the points there is what data would you collect? And I, even though I love a score and being able to see how much you've improved, but actually mm. the problem isn't probably measured in a score. It's, it, and you find out the you get really under the skin of it by having that conversation and that will help you to build things into uh, project plans that will manage that better. So I thought the process of going through each point and getting people's opinions and I can see that happening with practice nurses, GPs, practice managers, where you'll actually, that, those are the things that you'll end up uh, getting more successful outcomes because of the discussions and the insights you get from that. Yeah, great. We probably picked up on stuff that's already been said along change management and the tools that we use already, the theories we're familiar with, and therefore what would this add? But we did think it would be very useful for strategic planning mm. and for some of the analytics in terms of the 16 questions prompting. Yeah. So who do I need to involve in this? Mm. There was some discussion also about where it fits in the I've had a bright idea to the it is now normalized process. Mm. But we'd also like to explore how stuff becomes normalized. Yeah. Carl mentioned about moving from handwritten acetates to three-point PowerPoints. And mm. we do that. Everybody uses a mobile phone. Mm. Now, I predate mobile phones. When I was a kid, phones were things that plugged into the wall mm. and you couldn't take them with you, didn't even have a long wire to it. But it's just normal and it's evolving. Mm. And how do we do that? Because we do that without thinking about it. Mm. We did feel that we'd had headlines rather than mm. a lot of time to assimilate today, but that's okay. inevitable on something like this. Yeah. And it's a very complex thing. Yeah. The gentleman in the front was talking about the Language. bullet points underneath. And please don't break it down to everything you could possibly include on every occasion, because that will just stymie it completely. It becomes so complex, nobody would ever use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think how things become normalised, just to talk about that briefly, it's a, yeah, I, I think that's something that we've, we've done quite a bit of work on and there, and there isn't a magic answer for, it, 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 it really is thing to thing about what the issues are. But again and again and again, one of the key areas I think is the fact that, as I've moaned on earlier on, maybe collectively or individually, is that the thing is workable. The, the thing is, is, is achievable by those engaged with it. That seems to be one of the really key things. Actually, this thing isn't coming on and telling you you need to change your life and change your work routines to engage with it. That's the, 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 the kind of core of it again and again. 
I think in our group we shared a lot of the um, the discussions that have already been talked about. One of the things I think we we discussed quite a bit was this usability, was the simplicity, was the application to lots of different areas. Um, myself and a colleague are already using NPT in an evaluation study, and that's looking at the development and implementation of an app for hydration in care homes. Um, so using it to structure data collection, but also as an analytical device. But we also talked about uh, using it as a prompt and uh, almost as a feasibility prompt when thinking about new projects in, or the development of teams and setting up teams, um, helping to map that out and help the planning stage of that. Uh, so lots of positives. Thank you. Right, any other group? I mean, we've got down on the timetable um, key messages. I think mm. we've done all our key messages again and again mm. and again. And I think, I think you've raised all the key issues. I think we've at least kind of got across what we think are the key messages. Um, but this is an opportunity for, for you to sort of feedback what your kind of key take-home messages might be from all of this. Or if you've got any specific questions. Yeah. Otherwise... Um, we could end this really early, um, which would be a rare moment. Um, and if people want to have a further chat with either I or Tracy, we could do that more one-on-one -on -one yeah. for the rest of the hour. It's whatever people want, really. Okay, great. Um, so I was on the uh, table that just feedback about the unique selling point, and I think um, coming from uh, with an industry background to this, I think one of the things that is really I'm not entirely convinced about is in a climate where the health service is facing a, a lot of pressure um, and where we know innovation is very difficult to spread across the system and where the service needs to be delivered today, not tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, not next week, um, I'm not sure how much value this will add um, compared to, for example, reading a simple book by, say, Carnegie about how to win friends and influence people to convince them that your idea is actually the right thing. Yeah. Um, so so I, I just put that out there because I think um, if I don't, then I'll do you a disservice because it gives you the opportunity to sort of push back well, I think the idea of um, how to win, win friends and influence people is we see it again and again and again. You might get various people saying, yes, it sounds fantastic, but when it hits the ground and they engage with it, it mm. doesn't work. Yeah. The, uh, and they speak to people, and this, I was chatting about others, to MP Fit, they speak to people and say, well, we need to adapt this, this and this, and no bugger does it. These things, you lose all trust and all goodwill, and it goes out of the window. So it doesn't matter how good a sales pitch is, it's the thing in action has to, has to hold. Mm -hmm. and, and the issue about today rather than next week and now, well, loads of these things will not normalise. They will crunch around and cause major issues. And there's a kind of level of that lack of coherence with what's going on on the ground causes loads of problems and stress. So there's a kind of level of, equally in that context, you need to get quick wins. What are the practical mm -hmm. solutions? I am a pragmatist. I might be... I have a theoretical side, but actually, what are the quick, mundane wins you can do to make people's lives slightly better to engage with this radical change? So that's, I would be really modest about the kind of changes I could be involved with. What's, what's, what you've got leverage on and what you haven't. Yeah. Um, Darren Archer from Next. Um, I think, in, in my head, they, that, that might be kind of playing down some of what's actually within the model that you presented, though. We, we've just done an internal leadership program, and one of the quotes that sticks in my mind, about 75% of all major change fails, and that's in large organisation corporations that try to put those things in. Uh, and perhaps what you've got is something that's actually too simple, and by playing it down even more, that, that makes it even... That, that dumbs it down so that perhaps people don't pick it up in the first place. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think there's always an issue about pitching this. I mean, we do, we, we speak to, I mean, we could have exact same conversation with a bunch of academics in this room. And they'd be going, this is too simple, how dare you? 
doesn't this fit into this, that and the other, not management theory, but various academic theories. There's a level of what level does this work at? So I think yeah. you're right. We're kind of damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. But my question is, if it's useful, use it. Otherwise, don't bother. Um, it's as simple as that, really. Yeah. Yeah.